lot like last year. Every game I watch. What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Blazers Uprise post game show presented by Manta Sleep Mask. Today, we got me in my normal habitat, and we got Eric in his favorite habitat, Las Vegas. Down there, where are you at, Eric? We got we got Eric down here, uh, loving life, loving Vegas, man. How's it going down there, bro? It's going great. I'm at the uh, Caesars Palace sports book right now. Just watched. Uh, part of the Blazer game here, and uh, yeah, it was quiet enough to uh, stream, hopefully. Hopefully it's not too loud. Sorry if it is, but I'll try to mute when I'm not talking as much as possible. Yeah, it's kind uh, of a vibe, man. It's kind of a yeah, vibe. It was quieter. Like it. Now, of course, we got an announcer from Larry. We got to <laughs> watch him talk you, and I'm very jealous. Uh, how, what have you been drinking today? Like, are you all tipsy? Like, where are we at um, today, uh, started off this afternoon with like one of those big Fat Tuesday slushy drinks, um, and then I had, uh, we actually had a group on for Senior Frogs for the Baby Yards, <laughs> you know what those are, the like super long drinks, uh, so I had, uh, we got a group on for four of them. There's three of us because I'm here with my wife and my uh, daughter who just turned 21. And uh, but she had a really rough night. She is experiencing her first true hangover today, <laughs> and so she didn't feel like drinking. It's our last day, and we wanted to use the group on. So my wife and I ended up having two each of the big yard drinks, and then uh, um, and then. I've also had a couple of beers, just uh, gambling and stuff, and then uh, I wanted to have a drink for the stream, so I got a, another pina colada slushy drink, but 
it's almost gone because I, I got it a while ago. Man, I, I am jealous of that because the best drinks are down there in Vegas. I remember I went down there for 2017 Summer League and just being able to walk down a road, the strip, with a drink in hand was... I don't know, man. It was just a different experience. If you've never done that, chat, I'm not going to recommend that you drink alcohol, but if you're going to drink alcohol, that's a that's a vibe right there. So, uh, very jealous of you down there in Vegas, and uh, I'm just sitting here. I got uh, cherry vanilla sparkling ice, zero sugar, five calorie, whatever the hell. It's... it's flavored sparkling water so that's what i'm on right now <laughs> but hey chat should just be proud of me that i'm drinking some kind of water because normally i'm not on streams but uh man this is a good way to uh to mix it up to end the season um no, right. <laughs> no pun intended um had steven on the last post game show that was fun did you hear his amferty simons comparison i didn't i missed that part terry rogier oh. in terms of stats and i'll be honest the per 36 was similar but right. Chet hated yeah. it it was uh it was a lot of fun man <laughs> yeah big surprise you came on and hit on amferty right <laughs> yeah yeah it was chill, it was chill. but um Anyway, yeah, it's gotten a lot louder since, uh, it's gotten a lot louder there, Eric. I don't know what happened. I don't know if they turned on the air conditioning, but they don't really do that. Well, they do do that in Vegas, huh? Cause it's super hot. Um, but, but we'll do our best blazers in this game lose 192. They were up with like a quarter remaining. I forget if it was late third, early fourth, but they were up 86 to what? 79 was the score they were up pretty pretty big amount for this team considering who's playing right now the Warriors ca came into Portland and it was almost like they expected to be able to run away with this game not playing Clay, not playing Draymond um multiple players missed this game GP two weeks ducks the Blazers of course he didn't want to get booed and uh, they look like a team that was just kind of out of sync. 16 turnovers for them. Playing against a Blazers team that is starting... Started three rookies. Henderson Repair, Chris Murray, DeAndre Ayton. Another 20-10 and 10 game from him. The Warriors took over late, which you expected them to, right? Blazers have their worst offensive quarter. Fourth quarter, only score 18 points. End up with only 92 on the game. The Warriors kind of run away, ran away with it. Wasn't really surprised to see that happen. I was happy that this team was competitive on a floor with a Warriors team that was missing some guys, but still, you got Steph Curry, right? And the Blazers are actually able to hold him in check a little bit. 8 for 22, 5 for 16 from behind the three-point arc. Only one free throw attempt for Curry. 22 points, 8 assists, 7 rebounds. That's pretty solid defense on him. Um, it was just some other guys. Kaminga, 7 for 11, 19 points. Wiggins, 5 for 12, 15 points for him. Pajemski, Looney, and Moody uh, all had contributions off the bench for the Warriors, and that's really where they actually made some headway. Um, Looney, plus 19. Pods was a plus 13. Um, overall, interesting game. It was kind of similar to last game for Scoo. 18 points, 12 assists, 9 turnovers. Not the most efficient night, but still liking some of his playmaking, and he had some impressive moments. He's shown flashes, which is what I want. Um, and then Aiton, of course, his contribution. And then the rest of the team struggling. Chris Murray, one for seven from three. Brutal. Um, his three-point percentage continues to plummet. Duop Reith, two for ten in 14 minutes. Rough game for him. And Manaya gets 29 minutes. One for seven, one for five from three. That was that was the ball game. Eric, uh, your thoughts, man? Justin Manaya, competent NBA player, right? Inside joke. Uh... <laughs> But no, uh, I mean, yeah, you got your normal uh, six straight games now from Aiton with 20 and 10. Uh, Scoot, you know, has been doing his thing now towards the end of the season. Had some good games. Um, so you like to see that. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, they just didn't have much help in this one. Um, you, they got off to a good start. Uh, Warriors looked stuck in mud earlier in this game. Um, but then they came back, took the lead. And you thought, okay, now they're just going to put their foot on the gas. But Blazers did a really good job of hanging around. Uh, just didn't have enough gas or enough uh, 
talent, I guess, to to win this game in the fourth quarter. Yeah. Aiden says you look faded. He's not faded. He's tips. I'm not really that. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm cool right now. I'm not super faded. So I pretend to be drunk just to fit in. Sure. I don't know if I want to do that. That might be a little too embarrassing for me. Um. I think we just do the stream like completely twisted, right? You're down there in Vegas. Okay. You're getting twisted. You're down there in Vegas, right? Gambling capital of the world. Okay. So why don't we just play the odds? And why don't we just do Tankathon right now, Eric? Let's do it. All right. Well, Is Vegas lucky for Tankathon? We're doing some experiments, right? We experimented with Steven last stream. And we're going to experiment with Eric down in Vegas. What did you guys get with Steven? Six. Uh, wow, every soundboard thing is playing right now. Every game I watch. Why did every soundboard thing play? <laughs> We had we had the background noise of the of where you're at, and then we had every soundboard thing play. We had the the rich song. We had let's go. We had no. We had everything. We had everything. So just chaos in the people's ears is what we're going for. I love it. Uh, Blazers one game back, Eric. The Hornets won by one point yesterday against the Hawks. So the Blazers could still tie for third best odds if. They lose out, and San Antonio and Charlotte each win a game. This just makes that Charlotte win hurt even more. It's brutal. They would have been uh, tied for third right now if they lost that game. Yeah, with only the Spurs. Yeah. So, I mean, even losing against the Wizards, right? Like, would have been tied for third. So, they still got an opportunity, which is why this race has gotten fun. Um, you know, I thought the tank race was kind of over. I didn't expect Charlotte to win another game before between... Um, when the Blazers beat them and now, but they did. And San Antonio last day of the season has Detroit and they've been playing good basketball. I think San Antonio will win that game. I think if the Blazers lose out, they will tie for fourth best odds. Will Charlotte win another game? Let's quickly take a look at their schedule and see who they have up to end the season. They got Boston on Friday and at Cleveland on Sunday. So I don't really know exactly what Cleveland is going to be playing for there on the final day of the regular season. Um, I know it's, a bit packed where they are standings wise. So they may be playing for seating. So it's tough to count on Charlotte winning the last two games. Boston's playing for nothing though. Yeah, Boston's playing for nothing. They've lost some games. Um, still, my prediction, San Antonio is going to win on the final day of the regular season because they have at home versus Denver. They could win that game. Um, depending on who, how hard Denver goes, how hard Denver plays, and Wemby, you know, against Jokic is a matchup that, uh, you know, if there's going to be one guy that can slow down and stop Jokic long-term, it's probably Wemby. Uh, so that's a fun matchup. And then Sunday versus Detroit, that's the game that's going to be circled. So we're going to be standings watching as the Blazers and the Spurs both tip off at the same time, 12 30 oh no the blazers tip off at 12 30 our time right they better oh yeah this is pacific time i'm tripping i'm thinking it's eastern time yeah both these games are at the same time the blazers taking on the sacramento kings on the road and the spurs taking on the pistons at home so we'll be standings watching while we watch the blazers play their final game of the regular season the kings will likely be playing for something because they're hovering right around sixth seventh eighth line um so that game is going to matter. The other thing is the Lakers are now tied with Golden State, Eric. And this is interesting because the Warriors And have... Sacramento. Yeah, they're also tied with Sacramento. So Sacramento has the tiebreaker amongst the three. Golden State has the tiebreaker over LA. So they would get this playing game at home. The Blazers are really going to need to lose that final game of the regular season against Sacramento. So Sacramento doesn't fall to below Golden State. There is a legitimate chance that Golden State could be the eighth seed going into the plains and only need to win one out of two games for their pick to end up uh, like 16th, 17th. There's still a chance it could end up 18th because they're only a game behind Orlando and Indiana. And those teams are 18th, 19th. So th this pick is still up in the air. It could be as low as 19th. 
depending on tiebreakers and so forth. Or it could be as high as 12th if uh, Chicago or Atlanta play their way into the playoffs and um, Golden State, you know, if they're below L.A. and don't make the playoffs or if they're above L.A. but L.A. beats them and then L.A. plays their way into the playoffs. There's a, there's a lot up in the air with this pick right now. Um, so it's kind of hard. Even with only two games left in the regular season, it's still tough to tell exactly where that pick is going to be. Every team has two games left. Every team plays tomorrow. We'll have picks against the spread on our second channel. And then every team plays on Sunday and we'll have picks against the spread for that. So 30 games left. Uh, I went a whopping 13-2. and two, So I actually have a puncher's chance seven games back out of, uh, of chat. And chat's trying to choke at the end of the year. Um, but that's the tank picture. Let's simulate this thing. Scroll up from the bottom like normal. And see if Vegas is lucky for us. At 14, Portland gets Golden State's pick. At 13, Pelicans. At 12, OKC. At 11, Chicago. At 10 is Atlanta. At 9 is Houston via Brooklyn. I believe they got the first pick on Steven and mine, our sim. It was Houston via Brooklyn. Uh, 8 is Memphis, which means Utah has moved up into the top 4. 7 is San Antonio via Toronto. 6 is supposed to be the Blazers, and it is the Portland Trailblazers. No! Vegas isn't lucky, Eric. That's not. <laughs> Vegas is not lucky. Uh, let's see who gets the one pick. We got uh, Washington moving down three spots. We got Utah moving up into the top four. We got San Antonio at three. We got Detroit at two. And we got Charlotte at one. So the Blazers need to move up to four. Is what we just learned. Um, anyway, that is Tankathon. Um, Eric, thoughts on this game? Uh, just, just overall thoughts. Scoot, Da, whoever you want to talk about. Yeah, I think Scoot's looked a lot smoother lately. Especially, um, he had one shot that really impressed me in this game. It was a long two-point shot from the side. Uh, kind of a sidestep to it looked really smooth uh, didn't really have his normal uh, I wouldn't really call it a hitch but his little quirks that he does with the ball right before he shoots um, I thought it was a really really nice looking jumper and uh, obviously he's been passing at elite level um, for you know several weeks now um, but yeah I think uh, I mean the only real I mean, well, there's two negative things, or actually, I'd say three negative things. If we're just talking about offense, two negative things. His efficiency still isn't great, and the turnovers aren't great. But um, you just like to see more and more uh, games where he continues to be able to lead the offense and make it look somewhat competent despite how many players that are out. And I think uh, it's good to see. You just got to find a way to take care of the ball a little better and just be a little more efficient um, going into the next season. Yeah, you're just looking for pieces, right? You're looking for flashes, um, especially as the season winds down. And I'm feeling more and more comfortable about his game going into this offseason because of some of the flashes he's showing. And he's obviously grown, man. Like, you... Go back and watch this guy the first five games of the season. It is night and day a different player. He still has flaws. He's still having struggles with some turnovers. But he's definitely more comfortable. You can see that. Um, and he's also hitting shots that he would not have hit at the start of the year. That step back three he had at the start of this game was super impressive, man. Just an isolation against a uh, long, lengthy athletic defender in Kaminga who, you know, has his struggles off the ball defensively, but on the ball, that's a tough guy to shoot over. And, and Scoot, with the clock winding down a little bit, step back three from the corner. He couldn't make a wide-open three at the start of the season. He was, like, bricking, airballing wide-open threes at the start of the season. So that just shows the growth he's made with his shot. Yes, he goes two for eight tonight. He started two for four. Um, but he hit a couple step-back threes, Eric, and that's the stuff that's intriguing to me is, is a couple of those step-backs that he shot early in this game in the first quarter. Like he's showing some flashes of like off the dribble shooting from three. And that's good. It's mostly off of step backs. And 
something that I hope that he adds next year is his footwork on pull-up threes is bad. And I think he misses some pull-up threes, like especially going left, because he tries to set his feet going left, right, which you're always supposed to plant the inside foot first, where whichever way you're going. Um, his footwork could get better on pull-up threes. I think that's something that he'll work on this offseason, and that'll help his consistency when he's just dribbling into a pull-up three. But you like that he's showing that he can knock down threes off the dribble. Uh, and that gives me hope that he'll be able to be a dynamic three-point shooter. Maybe not on crazy efficiency, but he was, what, close to 32% from three going into this game? If he can be 35 36% on some sort of volume because he's able to hit threes off the dribble, then all of a sudden you're, his shot is completely fine and defenders have to respect it. So as it's not exactly where we'd want it to be, but given that he shot, what, 27% from the three-point line in the G League last year. It depends on if you just look at, like, different segments of the season because they segment it weird. But this is about as good as I could have hoped for him to look as a three-point shooter as a rookie. I wasn't expecting more than 32 33%. And some of the flashes that I've seen of some of the threes that he's hit, you know, I, I'm i happy with. So, shooting-wise, yes, 32%, 31% isn't a good percentage, but it's a good starting point for his career, and I'm happy with it. Yeah, for sure. If you're just looking at the three-point shot, um, that's definitely something we obviously were paying close attention to coming into the season. We wanted to make sure he showed signs of being a capable three-point shooter because we thought that would open up the rest of his game. So I think it has been a little disappointing that it hasn't, (laughs) that he's been decent enough from there to hopefully warrant opening up some lanes at some point. Um, so that's what's been disappointing is his his finishing and his inside game haven't been as good, but definitely encouraging to see him shoot that three well so that in the future, hopefully he's respected enough as a shooter uh, to like kind of bring that out and give him a little bit better open lanes so he can finish in zero around the right. You're muted. I just wanted to give chat, you know, five seconds of, of uh, silence, uh, a moment of silence. Uh, <laughs> but uh, no, what I was saying was uh, Scoot going left, man. That's that's what I want to see him add is that pull up, especially when defenders go under. He stutter steps his feet to set up his pull up threes when he's going left. Like he he puts the ball in his left hand. He like hangs it and then he like he gets happy feet. And he'll take like four steps when he only needs to take two to try and set up his three. And then there's times where he like goes up with it. And I feel like his base isn't set because he like gets happy feet trying to pull up going left. And that's where you see some bad misses. He has, I think he's had two threes because I went back and looked over all his three point attempts this year. I believe he has two threes where he's just ran straight into it, planted right, left, just, you know, it's the Dame footwork going left off the screen and pulling up, right? Ant is really good at it. Shaden Sharp got better at it this year. Um, And it's looked better. Uh, It's just going to take work for him to get comfortable with that because it's not natural to him. If it was, then that's what he would be doing instead of this stutter that he's doing, pulling up, going left. If he can add that at a high enough clip to punish defenders for going under, he will destroy teams. Because once you're able to pull up going left, you're able to work in hesitations off that. And if you're able to hit that pull up well enough, defenders will will lean forward or bite on that hesitation and he'll be able to beat them at will off pick and rolls. We, we saw that with Dame, right? He, get a screen 30 feet away from the rim. He'd come off going left. Defenders were maybe sagging a little bit because the screen's 30 feet away from the rim, but Dame can shoot those shots, can shoot those deep threes, and he just stops. Sometimes he wouldn't even, like, change the way he was dribbling the ball. Sometimes he would just, like, slow down for half a second, and defenders would jump forward because they were scared of him shooting that pull-up. And then it was really easy for Dame to beat guys into the lane. I don't obviously I don't expect Scoot to do that from that far out. And I don't expect Scoot to ever be a guy where defenders bite as hard on that hesitation as they do Damian Lillard. He's one of the greatest shooters shooters ever. But if he can get close enough next year, 
if he can work on that this offseason and he can get to the point where defenders have to respect it and he's able to work in some hesitations off that, the game will become much easier to him on, on pick and rolls. And then with the way he can feed the big on pick and rolls already and his athleticism attacking the rim, he'll look like a completely different player if he can just add that. Um, so that's what I'm looking forward to. And some of the shots that he shot off the dribble this year gives me even more hope that he'll be able to add that because some of the step backs he shoots and has hit this year, the footwork seems tougher on than just running into a pull-up three going left. Like the both the step backs he hit today, the footwork was tougher on, in my opinion. But he it was like those step backs, it was like quick little stutter steps because it was like quick little step back and he's comfortable with that. So that's why he's able to hit it. So once once he adds just more basic footwork, pulling up off screens, shooting that pull up three off screens, he's going to look like a different player. And that's why I'm super excited to see what he looks like next year. Yeah, absolutely agree with all that. Uh, just hope that he does work on that this summer, and that's a huge point of emphasis. I still think, I mean, a lot of this is offensive. I, I just... I don't know what his defense is going to ultimately look like, but offensively, yeah, if he can just get to those kind of levels that you're talking about, I'd be happy, I guess. Yeah, I mean, with the Blazers needing a star, I'm not too worried about his defense. I think he'll be better, but also it's like they need a guy to lead their offense. So whether that's sharp, whether that's Ant, whether that's Scoot, I'm going to care a lot more about that than their defense because you can have a good defensive team because of your role players, right? The best stars in the league are the best offensive players. Obviously, if you can defend two, that bumps your stock. That makes you an even better player and even more valuable to your team if you're a good defender on top of being the number one guy on the offensive end. But at this point, I'm just worried about the Blazers finding the number one guy on the offensive end. They can find guys that can defend, guys that can be role players and contribute in that way. Tamani Kamara is a great example. And he was taken with the 50-second pick, right? So it's harder to find that star player than it is to find good defensive role players. Um, so that's the thing with Scoot is definitely don't give him a pass for some of his defensive lapses, especially effort-wise this year. But ultimately, what's going to determine whether he's a bust of a third pick or a success is ultimately what he becomes as an offensive player. If he can be all defense like a Jalen Suggs, then that gives him a little bit more leeway. I just don't really expect that. I just hope that he continues to improve, especially with some of the extra stuff. Yeah, it's just tough when, as of right now, we have three guards who all suck at defense. You know, yeah. like, we need one of them to be at least neutral on that end yeah, ultimately, ultimately, yes. I don't think they're in position to make that decision yet, and it might be they trade the one who's the worst long term. So um, you hope that they improve and you see what that looks like with potential three-guard lineups with all three of them in it defensively. If none of these guys improve defensively next year, those lineups are going to get picked apart unless you have Alex R alongside a DeAndre Ayton or alongside a Robert Williams, then maybe that's enough for him protection to allow those guys to just overplay the perimeter, run guys off the line, and then funnel guys towards those two elite rim protectors. So that's where we obviously have to see what the roster looks like going into next season to complement those three guards. Um, but yeah, if, if these guys, if none of them improve going into next year, it just makes the job tougher and you have to surround them with even better defenders, even better rim protectors, especially at the power forward position. And Jeremy Grant's no slouch there as a secondary rim protector. Like, he's he's okay. But, obviously, an Alex Sar type of big is, is much better. You know, he could maybe be the Evan Mobley to a Darius Garland, Donovan Mitchell style backcourt defensively. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I think there's a big difference though between like competing and like just 
flat out being lost on defense and causing multiple breakdowns just because you're out of position all the time and stuff. So he's definitely got to improve that kind of stuff as well and just be a little more aware on that end. But uh, like you've been saying, as long as his offense masks some of the defense or makes up for lack of defense, I think we live with it for now. I 100% agree. Um, I want to talk about another rookie. Somebody I'm not as high on as Scoot. Uh, and you know who it's going to be, I think, because of this. But I rewatched all this, all of the three-point attempts this year from this guy. And it wasn't a fun experience. And that is Chris Murray. One for seven today. Eric, I am more and more convinced that he will never become a good NBA three-point shooter without completely reworking his form. Because I went back, watched every three-point attempt from this guy, saving a bunch of them for his review video that's coming up in the offseason. And, dude, I noticed just the ball does not come out of his hand consistently at all. And he had more shots than I remember where he's wide open and, like, airballing or breaking it off the backboard. And today, one for seven, his shot's flat. His release isn't consistent. He misses like all over the place. It's not even like he's missing just short where if you get a little bit more distance, he's going to be hitting a bunch of threes. I'm legitimately more and more worried about him as a shooter. I was worried about him before, but it's just another another one for seven night from him. Another one of these bad shooting nights. And obviously how he shoots the final couple games of the regular season isn't really going to change my opinion at all. But this was just very indicative of a lot of the shots that I watched when I went and re, re-watched all his threes. I mean, he has a pull-up three in transition that's pretty open. It doesn't even hit rim. Like, some of his misses are really, really bad. And it's one thing if you're shooting, like, 39 40% from three with some bad misses, like a Ryan Rupert, because he's had some bad misses too, but he's making threes. The problem is his shot's just all over the place, and his form just, the it does not look consistent. His release, his follow-through, um, the way his hand flicks through the ball, like, none of that is consistent in games. And it's part of the reason why he's been such a bad three-point shooter. So, he needs to do some work on his form this offseason. Sven calls him Miss Murray instead of Chris Murray. That's funny. Tyler James says he literally shot puts the ball. Uh, yeah, it's starting to remind me a little bit of a meeting. Not quite as bad of a catapult, but just the inconsistencies when you don't have good shot mechanics. It's... Uh, you can you can get hot, I guess, um, but you're never going to be consistently good, in my opinion, if you don't have better form than that. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing is you got to have a consistent follow-through. Your shooting elbow, your shooting wrist, that has to be consistent. If you're ever going to be somebody that can consistently make jumpers. And that's the part that is not consistent. You look at the shot he made today... He had a good f- good flick of the wrist. You can tell. He had a good snap of his shooting wrist. There's times where it feels like he only snaps his shooting wrist like halfway through the ball. It- it's it's different. And that's the big thing I noticed. Like I didn't really notice that watching him from game to game. Because it's just more so like, oh man, he missed that three. Just like hyper-focusing on his form was eye-opening. Um... It's going to be interesting to see what he shoots next year. It's going to be interesting to see what his next year is. This is it. I watched uh, the Warriors broadcast here, yeah. and uh, they were, man, they were saying, like, oh, he's, his game is so similar to, to Keegan's. And I'm just like, oh, my God, no, it isn't. Like, maybe it's similar, but he's nowhere near as good as Keegan. Yeah. yeah. He did play 45 minutes tonight. <laughs> Which is crazy. That's a lot. I mean, I'm not even complaining about it. End of the year, he's a rookie, whatever, right? The Blazers only had eight healthy players, right? So, I get it, but damn, that's a lot of minutes. He did some other good things. He had 14 points. He was, what, three for five inside the arc, five for six from three. 
I could take the shooting struggles if he was like a super consistent slashing threat and like a lockdown on ball defender. It's just, man, he has, he has to, he has to rework his form. He has to find consistency in his follow through if he's going to be an NBA caliber role, role player in a rotation for a team that's not tanking. He's 23, man. He's going to be 24 next season. It's not like he has a ton of time to figure it out. I'm worried. Right. That's the guy I'm worried about. Yeah. The worry, yeah, Tyler says the Warriors broadcast is obsessed with Mitchie Stiebel, too. Calling him a lead defender. I don't know if you saw him, Tori, but uh, Portland actually sent out defensive, all defensive team voters uh, cookies. Um with Matisse Thibel's stats is the nutrition facts on it. It was kind of a clever thing, but uh, so they're pushing for Matisse to get on one of the all defensive teams this year on a really bad defense. Bro, like, it, I replied to that. Th this conversation, I'm going to bring up a Twitter conversation just because it's indicative of exactly what I talk about with them. Um, there was... So I responded to that. No, no, I didn't even respond to it. Somebody just straight up tagged me and said, but Torrey Jones says he's a terrible defensive player. Sure, a lot of number one and number two rankings in terms of like deflection, steals, etc. And I said, please show me where I said he's terrible because I've never said that. I said he's overrated because people overrate steal and block numbers at the expense of solid defense. And this dude's like, might not have used the word terrible, but other synonyms were used to describe as D. You don't lead the league in steals, fouls, on threes, blocks, etc. By not gambling sometimes. No sense to have those stats and be mad about it. And I said, ah, oh, so you're putting words into my mouth and you're doing exactly what I talk about on post-game streams like this. By basing someone's defense solely off deflections and steals, which happen on less than 10% of defensive possessions. I care about the other 90% of defensive possessions. And it's baffling to me the way people just care about steals and blocks and deflections. Why do they care about it? Because it's the most easily quantifiable thing that occurs on the defensive end for a player, right? Every other stat or metric defensively is like advanced calculation and has noise and it's complicated, right? But you can see when someone gets a steal. You can see when someone gets a block. You can see when someone gets a deflection and then those are the easily quantifiable stats so people have a habit of just looking at those numbers and saying oh if 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 they have good numbers in those areas they're a good defender but those plays happen on less than 10 percent of their defensive possessions and it's one thing if you have a bunch of good defenders and a really good rim protector where you can afford a guy gambling and getting back cut all the time and closing out recklessly because he's trying to block every three-point shot, biting at pump fakes, all that crap. If you have a really good rim protector to clean up the drive after that, that's what he had with Embiid. Doesn't have Embiid now. He's okay defensively because he makes plays. But it's not on enough of possessions for him to ha deserve any sort of all-defensive team. Because when he's not getting deflection steals, etc., he's not a good defender. He gets back cut. His closeouts are bad when he, you know, players pump fake. He's out of position a lot, trying to hunt, trying to play passing lanes. That's my problem with, with Matisse, man. That's been my problem all year. Right. If you're gambling on steals and you get a steal, but the other, like, two, the next two possessions, you get backdoored for an easy basket that's not good defense it's just you hunting steals and it's uh yeah, like you said I, I hate when people try to justify that he's a good defender because of that he, he could be a really good defender in the right system with the right teammates around him and stuff um but and I, he does make some incredible plays his his ability to block three-point shots is a good skill. I mean, that's uh, he's one of the best, if not the best, in the league at that. Um, that is a good thing. But uh, how many times is that because he's not in the right spot and has to run out and chase him? I, I, I don't know. It's yeah, because uh, all those possessions are normally going out of bounds, 
and back to the other team. Right? So, is that really that impactful of a play? A steal going the other way is more impactful than a block three. But block threes are impressive. 25 block threes. Oh, my goodness. I don't know, man. Like, <laughs> Spencer, you don't have to worry about that, bro. You don't have to worry about that. Um... Yeah. I don't know. Bible's not playing, so I'm not going to talk too much more about him. But, yeah, it's it's funny seeing that sent out and having somebody say, See, he's not terrible. Look at his steals and deflections and blocks. It's like... It's funny when people listen but don't listen. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, deflections can be a really good thing. But if you look at them, I mean, there's... Not all of them, but there are some really bad defenders that are good at getting deflections, too. It doesn't necessarily mean you're a good or bad defender. Um, and I think Fiebel can be a good defender. I'm not trying to say he's terrible like that guy was insinuating you said. Yeah. But, but I just, I don't think a Thibault type, because he's not a point of attack defender. And so, in my opinion, the, the rim protectors and the point of attack defenders that can just lock someone up and or protect the rim and scare people from going inside or or alter multiple shots around the rim per game, those are way more impactful defensively, in my opinion, than someone who gets deflections off ball or blocks a few three, like half a three a game. You know, like that's that's pretty much it. Yep. Yep. Oh God! Speaking speaking of speaking of this conversation, I just got a reply, and dude, I'm I'm just tired. I'm tired. Of just some people on Twitter. That's all I'm gonna say. Uh, um, I'm not gonna rant about it anymore. Uh. Who else we got to talk about? Uh, repair one for six. Can you just struggle inside the arc? I will talk about that in his review. He just needs to get stronger, Eric. He's not like a super explosive leaper in traffic or if there's any sort of contact. And he ends up off balance a lot because he's just not strong enough. He has really long arms. He's going to need to learn how to become a finisher that initiates contact, I think. Um, Batum was kind of similar, right? Like, and he had plays where he'd finish, but, like, he was a little bigger. So it was a little bit easier, right? Like, there were shots that Batum would shoot that wouldn't get blocked that when Rupert shoots them, similar types of shots around the rim, he gets blocked. Some of that is Rupert has to get better at knowing when he's going to get blocked, but, man, he's been blocked a ton this year. A ton. Um... Shout out to Arvaro, gifted a Blazer Uprise membership, and it goes to Ninja Ghost. Shout out to Arvaro. Thank you, Alvaro. Appreciate you, man. Thanks, Albie. Shout out to Ninja Ghost for winning the gifted membership. But, uh, yeah, repair. He has to get stronger so he's not so off balance and so that he can, like, actually initiate contact. Because he doesn't initiate contact. Everything's, like, super finesse, weird angles where he's shying away from contact. If he can put on enough strength where he feels comfortable initiating contact on his, on some of his drives with some touch, because he I think he does have good touch, then that's what's going to um, help him a ton as a finisher and change his game. And with him being only 19 until late May, like, he has a lot of time to put on strength and learn how to initiate contact, all that stuff. I just hope he has the mindset. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, in my opinion, he's ahead of the curve already. Like, I wasn't expecting him to be able to contribute or do anything this year in, at, at an NBA level. Um, so just the fact that he has shown signs of being... Um, you know, a good passer at times, being able to handle the ball at times, being able to maybe be a, a good three-point shooter once he, he gets a little more consistent with it, unlike what we talked about with Chris Murray. Um, I, I think just seeing those things from repair this year uh, give me a lot of confidence in him moving forward. Um, just got to put in the work in the off-seasons and get better, and uh, I 
I wouldn't be surprised if it's still another year or two before he's ready on like a good team, but I also wouldn't be surprised if we're talking next year about him, like why isn't he playing more? He deserves to, a spot in the rotation. Um, he's kind of could go either way, and he's way ahead of schedule. So I, I just think pretty much everything that we've seen from him is a bonus right now. And uh, obviously he still needs to get way better than he is. I'm not saying he's accomplished or, or there or arrived or anything. But uh, I, I do think he has shown enough to believe in him long term. Yep. Fully agree. Um, yeah, so after just the summer putting on strength, I expect him to come back with, uh, you know, the Mike Barrett. He's added 15, 20 pounds of muscle in the offseason. Right, remember that with Martel Webster. <laughs> Fun times. Um, the Mike Barrett, everyone put on 15 pounds of muscle every offseason. Yeah, Mike Barrett would talk about me. I'd come back on stream after, you know, a, a vacation looking exactly the same. And he'd, he'd say I put on 15 pounds of muscle and gas me up. So that would be, yeah, that'd be cool. But uh, Repair needs those Mike Barrett pounds of muscle. Uh, Aiton, 12 for 24. He shot another three and he shot a free throw. Eric, I said this on last stream. It's funny because Aiton, I just hope that he shoots either one three point attempt or one free throw attempt in a game. Or, right? And we got both today. He was one for one from the free throw line and 0 for one Either from three. Either or is funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, round of applause for Aiton. He shot a free throw and a three in the same game. And, uh, wasn't the most efficient night from him. 12 for 24 from the field. 12 for 23 inside the arc, right? Like, only getting to the line one time. 25 points on 24 shots. He's, he put up impressive numbers. 25 and 11. Three steals. I don't want to say this is a good game from him compared to how well he's been playing because he has been playing well. Compared to how he's been playing, this was a little bit of an off night because he wasn't as efficient as he has been as of late because lately he has been um, more efficient than this. Yeah, I mean, kept the streak going, the 20 and 10 streak. Uh, I mean... He started off, it was pretty brutal. He missed a couple or like three or four jumpers that he had been hitting all season. And that's the problem when you're not getting three point shots and free throws, like you said, is it's not normal to be that automatic from mid range. And over the past couple of months, he has been automatic. So when you start missing some, it just, it, it stands out a lot more. So if he's not hitting, it's not exactly that he's bad or anything he's just missing or regressing back to the mean on that and uh and so uh, i think yeah it's fine he's gonna have games like this it's gonna be uh up and down in terms of the mid-range in a normal season if he's not just like scorching hot yep absolutely um jabari hits a couple threes 17.16 rebounds. He's been possessed on the board. Seven offensive rebounds for Jabari in 36 minutes. Six for 14. Two for three from three. Three for four from the free throw line. So good to see him have an efficient night shooting the three ball. He struggled with his shot much like Chris Murray. But he doesn't shoot anywhere near as many. And maybe that's part of the thing that bothers me with Chris Murray is, uh, man, he... He has to be a shooter, so I have no problem with him shooting threes, but this dude, they're both shooting pretty much identical numbers behind the arc, 28%. Um, Jabari, I feel like, doesn't take as many to try and find a rhythm, though. He's more aggressive, um, attacking the paint, crashing the gra glass. Uh, I think he can maybe get away with some subpar shooting a little bit more. Um, but it was nice to see him knock down a couple threes today. 
Yeah, his rebound's been a problem for a lot of teams. The Golden State uh, broadcast was mentioning how efficient he's been on the offensive rebounds. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we know that's an elite skill set from him. Uh, he's had some some bad shooting games and some good shooting games recently. So once again, just like a lot of players we talked about, just getting more consistent with that would be good for him. But um, it's it's weird because I think he's only like 20 or 21, so he's still two or three years younger than Chris Murray, and. Uh, I believe, right? Isn't he younger? Is he 21? Yeah, so... Like, they get lumped together, and obviously Jabari's in his second year, and Chris is a rookie, but I think he's got a couple years younger on him, so he still has a chance to to improve. And, and I mean, he's already better than Chris, but, um, like, you know, two years from now... He's all, yeah, he's 21, almost 22. Yeah, yeah two years younger. Uh, one of them's born in July, one of them's born in August. Um, yeah, so he, he has more time. It's going to be interesting to see how they handle those two guys. Those two guys, I think, are going to be compared until one of them's gone because they both play the same position. They both can do, like, the, the little things a little bit. Um they aren't the most athletic guys but they can use their body a little bit to finish and both have struggled shooting the three ball jabari just has age on his side compared to chris but that's why those guys are going to be compared um jabari's contract what he was on a three-year contract initially so it ends next year whereas chris can have up to three years left on his contract that might mean that they keep Chris over Jabari long term. And I mean, maybe they don't have to choose, but at some point in a rebuild, it probably doesn't make sense to keep both of them. Which one do you think goes first and when? Oh, well, I think it's clearly got to be Chris that goes first, right? But he's also on a four year rookie contract. Um, is only one year into that deal. Jabari actually, they could cut him this summer. I, I don't, I'm not saying they will, but I think he's non-guaranteed next year. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I'd be surprised if it wasn't Jabari that they kept long-term of the two. But also, I mean, he's going to be a free agent faster, so. You know, when they have to pay him, it might come into play where, um, you know, because after next year, I think Jabari then is a free agent outright. Um, so it might be a case where a team pays him or something and Blazers don't want to match and they still have Chris for two more years on a rookie deal. So I think it might be Chris that they end up keeping. Um, but I think... Man, if this summer a team like the Kings, who were desperately hoping that Chris fell to their pick at 24 and then it immediately traded the pick after it wasn't available, if they're still interested in Chris at all, I think you've got to explore uh, getting some value for him. I don't think they will, but yeah, I, I think you've got to got it right now. Yeah, surely we could get like Malik Monk and Harrison Barnes back, right? And oh, with, yeah, like, Chris so. Murray being the centerpiece as a first-round value mm -hmm. to help the Kings save, like, $4 million? Right? That's how it works, right? Oh, wait, no, that, that only works against us. It doesn't, doesn't work for us. Well, I'm sure that doesn't work because they, they wait, make way too much money. But. All right, well, it's our <laughs> Eric Bledsoe contract. Uh, Malcolm, an injured Malcolm Brogdon? Whose expiring contract, even if he's injured, could be the most valuable expiring contract in the league. That's just what we have to tell Sacramento, right? You're getting a first round value and you're getting Keegan's brother and you're getting the most valuable expiring contract and you're saving money. I think that, that's a team that might take a chance on Brogdon in the summer. Yeah, possible. I mean, Davion Mitchell hasn't really worked out. Uh, I think a team will... I don't know, man. I don't expect a team to trade a first for Brogdon at this point. 
It's it's going to be tough. He got the 30th pick last offseason with two years left on his deal. Now he only has one year left on his deal. And he has more injury questions than before. He hasn't played since the trade deadline. So... Yeah, I got some. Go ahead. I got to go in a minute, but before I do... Uh, so, I've heard one of the reasons he was not traded... And one of the reasons why it's going to be very difficult to move him this summer is the Blazers are scared to share his medicals with anyone because they're half. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean. I mean, I don't know. Like, hopefully not. You know, hopefully a team still takes a chance on him, but... You know what? That... That is scary because that would make more sense why you started hearing, oh, they want to keep him, veteran mentorship, yada, 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 two weeks before the trade deadline. Right. When we have three young guards already. And we need to save this money. So, I mean, at the end of the day... (laughs) At the end of the day... At the end of the day, Eric, I think that is very possible. And I think that's possibly why they kept him. And the spin is obviously, we love him as a mentor because they don't want to go out and say his medicals are F, right? But at the end of the day, that means he has no trade value. And how are you going to get rid of him? And is the Celtics trade now questionable? Right? We flipped Drew Holiday for a Warriors pick in a weaker draft and a future Boston first that is probably still going to be late first because they're phenomenal, right? And have a lot of solid young talent. Okay? And then we get back two injured players who I was begging for them to flip before the season for a freaking reason. And I got so much hate because I didn't come on stream saying, oh my goodness, Joe Cronin's a genius. This trade is amazing that he got back for Drew Holiday. Like, and then when I said, I want to flip both of them, people also acted like I was freaking crazy. Guess what? This isn't hindsight. Yeah, when he he showed he was healthy at the beginning of the season, you had to trade him right then. We talked about that earlier in the year. You had to get rid of him. He was not, we had players like Jeremy and, and Matisse that we couldn't trade till January 15th. But Malcolm has been tradable since we acquired him. Um, I I think that's going to end up being a huge misstep. Once he showed that he could play earlier in the season and was playing well, you had to deal with that. Absolutely, man. Eric, it just gets frustrating. Like, seeing some of these potential problems ahead of time, right? Um, And then getting, getting criticized for it. And then when these problems happen, the organization will, like, excuse it away with some BS that those same people criticizing me will buy with Cronin has a plan. You just got to trust him. It's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. I mean, just look at Matisse Thibault and imagine this contract, Eric. They would probably dump it for nothing right now if they could because they're $8 million into the tax or whatever. You mean all defensive player Matisse Thibault. You've got to match that. And when I said we shouldn't match them, people acted like I was crazy. Why would you not match him? When we traded two second round picks for him, when he was never going to be a difference maker for Dame, and then we entered a rebuild after doing so, and we're put in a position to either eat that cost or match an $11 million a year contract for Thibel. Like that whole thing. I got criticized for not liking trading for him in the first place. And then I got criticized when I said they shouldn't match him. I mean, it's just foresight though, because the books are effed financially for a team that is losing 60 games this year. And they're going to have to figure out how to duck the tax. They should have traded Malcolm Brogdon and Robert Williams before the season, because both of them are injury prone and it made sense to flip them. But no, we maybe want to be competitive this year. And that Celtics trade, if Brogdon and Robert Williams the third because their injuries have no value. Getting back a mid first round pick this year and potentially a late first round pick like five years down the line and that's it for Drew Holiday is not good. 
And I raised that possibility when that trade happened and people just just thought it was blasphemous. Yep. Sorry, Tori, but I got to get going. Thanks, uh, everyone, for watching. Sorry, I can't stay longer. Give me, give me, I can blow what's going on, but I can rile up just to go so long. I'm yeah, sorry, it, man. I, now I'm in a ranting mood. Uh, yeah. Appreciate you hanging out with us while you're in Vegas. Thanks. Sorry, everyone, that it was loud, but I uh, wanted so, to jump on and talk to you guys. I'll wait, talk so to you all tomorrow night. Yeah. Oh, you're back right. tomorrow night, huh? I, sh I should be back in time for the stream tomorrow night. Yeah. All right, love you all. See you later. Bye. Have a good rest of your night. Thanks. All righty. Anyway, chat, I, I just... I, I tend... I think I believe Eric. And I'll be honest. I don't believe everything that Eric shares and it's not that i don't trust that eric's here heard it i just don't always trust the information he's given right and listen everybody's given info that ends up true and info that ends up false right nobody bats 100 so i don't believe everything but it would make sense that the blazers kept brogdon because of his medicals, given that this dude has been out the rest of the season. Given that his medicals were an issue last offseason. He was included in that trade for the Clippers, and then the Clippers vetoed it because they didn't have time to do a physical based on, like, CBA rules. And then, if I recall correctly, if Erickson chat, maybe he can remind me. Didn't the Blazers waive his physical when they traded for him? I don't I don't remember. I wish I did. I don't remember. But if they did, and now his medicals are are so bad they can't get anything back for him. Then that just shows they should have freaking done a physical. And that deal came together so fast. I I don't I don't remember. They might have done a physical. They might have done a physical, which if they did and cleared him, then it would make even it would make less sense for his medicals to be a problem. But I mean, the dude's missed two months, and the narrative is supposedly they wanted to keep him to be an on-court veteran mentor until the off season, but they didn't put him on the court for a single second between the deadline and the offseason. That doesn't really add up to me. But that is the narrative from the organization. Some Something is iffy there. Something doesn't add up there. So I am inclined to believe what Eric just said. Because to me... That does make sense. Smog says, Heiken said both Time Lord and Brogdon passed their physical at the start of the season. Okay. Then it makes less sense. Either way, something doesn't make sense to me, though. Do you, chat, do you feel what I'm saying? Do you, uh, does this not make sense to you either? Or... Is there something maybe I'm missing or you think I'm missing with this? Because it never really made sense for me, for them, to want to keep Brogdon past the de trade deadline in the first place. Yes, you got a veteran mentor, but... But... You're projected to be far into the luxury tax with a rebuilding team in the offseason, and we know they don't want to pay the tax. And it's going to be harder to duck the tax... Because most teams, if not all teams that would trade for Malcolm Brogdon, will have to match a salary and send out salary back that would be on the books next season when we're projected to be in the tax. Whereas if you traded him at this year's trade deadline, you could have gotten back expiring contracts that expired this offseason so you would have been out of the tax. And it, it, just out of nowhere, all of a sudden they want to keep him. I don't think ownership wanted to keep him financially. 
And it didn't make sense to wait until the offseason, considering he didn't play. <laughs> there was no on-court mentorship from him between when they decided to keep him and the offseason when now they're supposed to trade him. It's interesting. It's interesting. That information, of course, take it with a grain of salt. Don't believe it if you don't want to. Okay? It might not be correct, but it does make some sense. And it is interesting. One Piece says, I don't think Brogdon is that injured too. Maybe like 15% chance Eric's rumor is true. I mean, he was injured last offseason, needed surgery. And now he's injured again. Now he's injured again. For two months. Why has he been out for two months? If he's not that injured and they wanted him as an on-court veteran mentor. Especially given that Shaden Sharp hasn't played. They've been playing Ashton Hagens. It hasn't really made sense for them to sit him in terms of... Uh, the guard log jam because you've been missing one of those guards. And Scoot missed a lot of time. And Ant's missing time. Now, of course, at some point you sit him down to tank. Right? Like Jeremy Grant's not playing. He's been doubtful for multiple games in a row. But we weren't at that point at the deadline. They played Jeremy Grant. They played Anthony Simons after the deadline. So, I don't know. I'm looking up. So, Brogdon received treatment on February 12th. Wealth, the Blazers announced that Brogdon had received treatment for tendonitis in his right elbow and would be reevaluated in two weeks. Brogdon received platelet rich plasma therapy. On his right elbow. Let me look up just to make sure I got this whole thing. 100% correct. Because I'm pretty sure that's what he had surgery on last off season. Or was it surgery? Let me let me look this up. Cuz I don't remember. Oh, it was a torn tendon in his hand. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to believe. I think that's believable, though. Alvaro says, oh, yeah, I don't know about that. Plasma is usually used to heal pretty messed up tissue or ligaments. Yeah, plasma therapy doesn't, doesn't sound... I know it's a legitimate treatment, right? That some guys... help some guys, but tendonitis... Reevaluate in two weeks. But he's out for two months. One Piece says, if you were seriously injured for all these months, would we have heard more noise? Not all these months. But I don't know. I don't know. Either way, neither, neither scenario fully adds up to me. And what, if there was any media that's in with Joe Cronin listening to the stream, they would tell you that they wanted to keep Brogdon and he has a problem with his elbow, but he's going to be fine and they can trade him this offseason like they originally planned to do and they can duck the tax and that any speculation is just completely unreasonable and Joe Cronin knows exactly what he's doing with Malcolm Brogdon. That's what they would tell you. And maybe they're right. I don't know, though. It's very reasonable to question it. 
Alvaro has a quote in chat doing the research for us. Shout out to Alvaro. Says, the use of platelet-rich plasma, otherwise known as PRP, and stem cell represents the mainstream technologies to repair and rejuvenate the damaged tissue caused due to injury or chronic diseases. Chronic diseases. It is very reasonable to question it. And if it was true, this team wouldn't let you know. The media that the general manager of this team talks to regularly, that media wouldn't tell you that. If that was true. Keyword if, because I don't know. I don't know, but I don't really know what to believe. Either way, this offseason is going to be interesting to see if they can trade him. If they keep him this offseason going into next year, or they dump him for next to nothing, that shows you that what Eric said is most likely correct. Because why would they keep him? Because they're not getting good enough trade offers just to give him away for next to nothing in the offseason. After not playing him. After he couldn't be that on-court mentor that supposedly they value so much even though they have three young guards and don't have a spot for him when everyone's healthy. That's a storyline to watch this offseason. I have a feeling they're they're going to struggle to trade him even if this isn't an issue. Even if it's something where like he'll be healthy. Because like I said last offseason, he only got traded for the 30th pick. That was basically it. And there was people scoffing at first round picks in return for Malcolm Brogdon at this year's deadline. This is fascinating, man. This is fascinating. Let me know what you think in the chat. Appreciate you guys tuning in. I just wish this wasn't a conversation. Like, they should have... Maybe they tried. But they should have tried to flip them before the season. If you have three young guards, yes, it helps for them to have a mentor. But your head coach is now a Hall of Fame point guard. You can go sign freaking Earl Watson out of retirement on a minimum contract to be a veteran mentor, just like he was a veteran mentor to Dame. If you really need a guy that's like in uniform, right? And practicing. Earl Watson probably, probably not good for him to practice, right? I'm being a little sarcastic. But the point is, if you could have gotten value for Brogdon before the season and you needed an on-court mentor, you could have went and signed someone. You could have went and traded for someone a team didn't really care about. While getting back value for Malcolm Brogdon, not being projected to be in the tax this offseason, not having this whole question mark of his health status hanging over his potential trade candidacy this offseason. So. But what did Eric tell you before the season? And what are you hearing now? They want players, not picks. Steven said it. Last postgame show, Steven said that. Steven Vaughn. They want players, not picks. We've heard they want to trade the Warriors pick. They've like, they're not keeping that pick. Okay. We've heard they want to be like the Houston Rockets this year, the 11th seed, right? But they were in the play-in when we heard that, right? They want to be this year's Houston Rockets next year, okay? They don't want to actually, like, deal with the pain of a rebuild. 
Eric said that before the season. And then it's, they want to keep Robert Williams. They want to keep Malcolm Brogdon, right? They got their future rebuilding assets in the Dame trade, right? Because you can sit there. We got three picks and two swaps. And some casuals will think they got five picks because of it, right? But two unprotected picks and a pick this year, right? And you can sell that. But you also got Malcolm Brogdon. And you also got Robert Williams. Guys that... It seems like this team thought could help them remain competitive. And Eric said before the season. They they like having the excuse of we're rebuilding, we're young to fall back on in case they suck all season. And also the injury thing. Because Blazers were ravaged by injuries this year. They like having that to fall back on so they don't have to take the heat. But they're quietly hoping that they're good... Or competitive this season. And then we know how this season played out. And now we're basically hearing that that's what they want to do next season. And I believe that's why they didn't look to flip Brogdon or Robert Williams before the season. Because they want to be competitive. Because they don't truly want to fully rebuild and it goes right back to the lack of direction this organization has that we've talked about for so long and if a team is truly committed to rebuilding they would have gotten value back at the start of the season for both Robert Williams and both Malcolm Brogdon maybe a first round pick for each to get four picks out of the Drew flip right because they would have been rebuilding. They wouldn't have cared about winning as many games as possible this season. Guess what? They won 21. <laughs> they won't even say the word rebuild. Shout out to Sven and chat. Yeah, they won't even say the word rebuild. I don't know, man. If I think about it like this, it does, does add up to me. Does add up to me. That's why they kept them. But I said, both these guys are injury risks. Both these guys should be flipped. You got DeAndre Ayton as your starting center. Why do you need to keep Robert Williams, who's likely to get injured, to be the backup? You're going to play him next to each other? You just drafted a power forward with a first-round pick that's NBA-ready, and you just paid another power forward a $160 million contract. And you supposedly value Jabari Walker as a power forward, yeah, you're going to play Robert Williams at some power forward because you have DeAndre Ayton, who you're going to give a bunch of minutes to, but you want to keep Robert Williams and play him enough to justify keeping him. Silly. Silly. Like, this is the stuff me and Eric have a problem with. But it's like, we say it before, and then it plays out this way, and it's like, see... While people just say, oh, you're just looking to criticize them. I mean, I, I think we've shown a lot of foresight over the past year regarding Thibault's contract. Now he's the sixth best perimeter player, point guard, shooting guard, small forward type of player. He's the sixth best. And we could draft one that slots in ahead of him, bumps him down to seventh best. Because you got Banton now, you got Kamara. You got Scoot. Simons, Sharp, all players that play point guard, shooting guard, small forward. Where's the man? You're going to play Thibel over one of those guys? You're paying him $11 million a year. You match his contract. Now you're $8 million into the tax. Should never have matched him. But hey, guys, don't forget Matisse Thibel, all NBA defense, all defensive team. He hasn't played in a minute. We got other young perimeter players looking good. Let's remind people that Matisse Thibel is a phenomenal defender. Let's send out some campaign thing for Matisse Thibel all defense. I'm going a little overboard here, but <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Um, anyway, Banton is better than Thibel. I mean, I think he's as good as Thibel. He's cheaper than Thibel. He has more upside than Thibel. Yeah, like, with Banton's played, what? 
the Blazers should play Thibel over him next season? I, I'd rather find out that Banton actually sucks by playing him next season than continue to play Matisse Thibel, who's a fringe rotation player on a good team. Banton's younger? Like, why should Thibel be ahead of Banton in the rotation next year? You can make the case that Thibault's better than Banton, but in terms of this team and where they're at, it makes more sense to play Banton ahead of Thibault. Thibault's sixth in the pecking order next year, in my opinion. I think the organization would get some backlash if they played Thibault ahead of Banton next year. And what? If you're drafting it at 5-6 and Buzelis is gone... And Sar's gone. Who are you drafting? Who are you drafting? You legitimately have... What, you're going to draft Klingon? Okay, so what, you're going to run Klingon at the three, Robert Williams at the four, and Aiton at the five? And do up Reith off the bench? I mean, I could see this team because they have Matisse Thibel and they want to play Thibel and Kamara and Banton and the three guards. Shoot, right now they still have Brogdon on the roster. <laughs> so Thibel is technically seventh, as it is. Um, I don't know. Like, if your best options are Cody Williams, Stephon Castle, you're going to say no to those guys because you have Matisse Thibel? No, of course not. You got to draft the best player. I don't even think this organization would say no to those guys because of means Matisse Thibault because that's ridiculous, of course. But then it goes back to, okay, if you're going to draft those guys, Thibault's seventh, eighth in the pecking order in terms of point guard, shooting guard, small forwards. But he's making $11 million a year? Why? When you're rebuilding? <laughs> Why? <laughs> it doesn't make sense, man. This is the type of stuff that drives me crazy. Never made sense to match his contract. It doesn't make sense even if you don't consider the fact that they're projected to be in the luxury tax next next year. By multiple millions of dollars. Anyway. <laughs> Just shows to me a lack of a plan. A lack of direction. But guys, next year, they might be this year's Houston Rockets. And they might get the 11th seed and have the 12th pick. Aren't you guys excited? <laughs> I mean, I'm not sold on that. I'm not sold on that. Anyway. Sorry the stream's gotten a little negative, but... We haven't really talked about this, this, the state of this organization in a while. I feel like all the, all this, this entire conversation is very legitimate. But he's wholesome vlog, man. <laughs> hey, I like, I like Matisse, man. I like Matisse. He's a Washington guy. I like him. He's a YouTuber. I like him. I'm happy for him that he got paid. I'd have been happy for him, happier for him, if he ended up in Dallas like he reportedly wanted, because there was some sort of report rumbling that like he wanted the Blazers not to match that offer sheet that the Mavericks gave him. Could have had the best of everything. I mean, but then again, you know, it goes back to the trade deadline where they uh, they trade for Cam Reddish and Matisse Thibel, and it's like supposedly guys that can help Dame. I mean, what are we talking about? Anyway, Gabe Carrero says, "Good news is the is the season is almost over, and the world is the Blazers' oyster in the off season." Joe Cronin seems like the type to uh, enjoy oysters. Nothing against that. I don't eat seafood personally, but 
if you enjoy oysters, this that's not an attack on you. Joe Cronin just seems like an oyster type of guy. But maybe he likes steak like Gabe, because Gabe loves himself a good steak. Don't you, Gabe? <laughs> oh man. Truly Spencer says you're really, you're speaking of the reality of this team. I mean, if everything I've said is correct, this franchise wouldn't want you guys knowing that. Just keep that in mind. It's okay to be skeptical despite people acting like it's not okay to question this organization with where they're at right now. It is definitely okay to be skeptical of the way they're going about things and their lack of a direction and Malcolm Brogdon's injury and their decision to keep him, but maybe they had to. Anyway, I'll take questions the rest of the stream. What do you think happens in the play-in? I think, um, I don't know. I think the Warriors beat the Lakers and then toss up in the next round. Puzelis or Risa Shea, I, I guess. I mean, Risa Shea's a three. Dude, I legitimately, I do not want Risa Shea. I don't want Risa Shea. I don't know if I'd want Risa Shea playing over Kamara. And people are going to think that's crazy. I don't understand the Risa Shea love. There's been other people that pay a lot of attention to the draft that also have similar questions about Risa Shea. It's not just me. It's not just Eric. I don't understand the Risa Shea love at all. Well, he's tall. Yeah, he's like 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, but not super strong. He's like a big, small forward. But if he can play power forward... With Grant next year getting 34 minutes a game. You gonna play him 14 minutes a game? Or are you gonna play him at some three? Sven says, fair enough, I'm scared about the Williams pick too. At least he can create a little bit. At least he can create a little bit. I don't want to draft a forward who can't create. I know he's a great shooter. I know he projects as a guy that should be a good defender. Why is a 3 and D guy being talked about as the potential number one pick in this class? I know it's not as good at the top, but there's enough upside where you shouldn't be talking about a projected 3 and D guy as the number one pick in the draft. And maybe he comes into the league and all of a sudden transforms himself as a creator and then is worth the number one pick. It's just tough for me to draft a guy and just assume he's going to be completely different as a creator when he has not shown enough flashes of creation. He's not super quick. He's not a sharp ball handler. You can tell he doesn't really know how to be shifty. He's not somebody that's like, that smoothly changes pace. He just doesn't have a lot of the traits that you look for in a guy when you're hopeful that they can become good creators at the next level. Because people all the time are like, you're too low on Risa Shea. I think consensus is way too high on Risa Shea. Every time I hear Grant as our power forward, I want to puke. It would make total sense for the Blazers to try and trade Jeremy Grant this offseason. But they won't because they want to be next year's Houston Rockets. So they want to pay a non-all-star between 30 and $40 million a year. Just like 
the Rockets did with Fred Van Fleet. Soy Girl says, I don't mind a 3 and D guy as a number one pick, but I'm skeptical about Risa Shea's three and his D still. Yeah, that's the other problem with Risa Shea is he's not a sure thing as a three-point shooter. He went on a massive slump to end the season. He's a below 70% free throw shooter. He was not known as an elite shooter until this past year. And it was a small enough sample size where he might have just had a hot streak. And also his defense is no sure thing either. So you're, dra you're potentially drafting a 3 and D guy, number one, without his elite shooting being a sure thing at all. And with his defense having some question marks. I, I, I just, I don't understand. I do not understand that at all. It's fascinating to me. And... If this was last year's draft, like, where does he even go, man? Let me look up the picks in last year's draft because I forget past six off the top of my head. Seventh was Koulibaly. I mean, Koulibaly showed more creation. Showed more defensively. Maybe it wasn't looked at as the same level of shooter, but was a good enough shooter? I don't know. If Reese Shea was in last year's draft, if he was, if he would be looked at as above Koulibaly or above a Jairus Walker. Because that's the guys that were taking 7th and 8th. Is he really a better prospect than those guys? Would... Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Taylor Hendricks... Was... He's a big man. He's bigger. I think he's more athletic than Risa Shea. He shot 39% from three in college, including a much better free throw percentage, 78%. And projected more as like a switchable rim protector. Is Risa Shea a better prospect than Taylor Hendricks? I don't, I don't know. I like, I would probably take Taylor Hendricks above Risa Shea if Risa Shea was in last year's draft or if Hendricks was in this year's draft. Like, it's just interesting to compare Hendricks to last year's draft. Like, this year's draft is weaker, but man, he there's prospects I like a lot more. A lot more. Tori, you have to pick between Risa Shea or Murray playing next season. I mean, that's easy. I pick Risa Shea over Murray. Like, if Risa Shea is there at, like, 12 or 13 with the Warriors pick, like, I am happy to get him. I am happy to get him. And then you just say, man, hopefully he just like completely transforms as a creator. And then we have, you know, maybe a start. It's just, at some point it makes sense to take him with the floor being like, okay, he should be able to knock down some threes and he should be solid defensively. And he has some length, right? Like there is a legitimate higher floor there than a lot of guys in this draft. But at the top of the draft in the top 10, I'm drafting for upside because you can find three and D guys that are veterans via trade, via free agency. You can't find guys that are young with star level upside via free agency. If you're Portland. And to get them via trade, you have to trade a ton of assets. A ton of assets. Whereas it makes sense if you're in the draft in the top 10 just to take that chance. By drafting for that. So that's my philosophy. I don't think that philosophy will ever change. I think at some point, you know, in this year's draft, maybe you... Maybe you go for more role players a little bit earlier because there is a little bit of a lack of upside. So at some point, it just makes sense to just take the safer pick. But, man. That line, I don't... I don't think is in the top ten. There's a reason why I have on my big board Topic, Klingon, and Risa Shea, 11, 12, 13. That's where that line is, after 10. I have Dalton Connect at 10, because he's a high floor guy who's older, but I think he has a l little bit more realistic upside than Risa Shea. 
Yes, he's a little shorter, but he's a better athlete. I think he can be a better finisher. I think he can be a better movement shooter. Great elevation on his jump shot. So I've connect a, I've connect a couple spots ahead of him. That's why. Um, I got Salon at nine. Salon is very raw, but he, in my opinion, has more upside than Risa Shea. I would rather have Salon than Risa Shea. Tyler James says, Andy has the right mentals in terms of connect. Yes. What scares you with Topic? The shot, the athleticism, um, the shot, for sure. If you look at a lot of previous drafts, the biggest bust taken in the top 10 were point guards that struggled to shoot. And especially point guards that struggled to shoot that weren't top-notch athletes. Chris Dunn, Emmanuel Moutier. You can even go all the way back to Ricky Rubio going ahead of Steph Curry. Right? Ru Rubio became a solid player, but you took him ahead of Steph Curry. You took him fifth. And you thought he could be a star. He never became a star because he couldn't shoot well enough, wasn't a good enough athlete to, like, make up for that. Right? So, and then Topic. So Topic has those concerns for me, and he's been injured. He has injury questions. That worries me. And I have a tough time seeing him become a star. I just, the way he shoots the ball kind of bothers me. And now consensus is starting to fade him a little bit. I have him just outside the top 10 for those reasons. Um, What about Buzelis? I mean, Buzelis 6'10 ball handler that moves well with the ball, is fluid, can change pace. Shown much more in terms of like passing and creation flashes than Risa And he's bigger. I'd much rather bet on that and hope his shooting comes around than bet on Risa Shea's shooting and hope that Risa Shea's creation comes around. Because I think it's easier to develop your three-point shot, especially for a guy like Buzelis, who before this past year, he wasn't looked at as a worse shooter than Risa Shea. He was looked at as like a really, really good shooter. He's struggled, but he's also shooting from an NBA three-point line where other guys are shooting from shorter three-point lines. So it's reasonable, in my opinion, to bet on Buzelis's traits that are harder to teach. Bet on his feel, bet on his ball handling, bet on his creation potential, bet on his playmaking potential. And hope that that shot returns to what it was before this past year in the G League. Because if that happens, you got a potential star. I have Buzelis number two on my big board. Because I think he has legitimate star upside. I think he has a lot of traits you look for in a player becoming a star. Yes, he has some question marks, but... I think he could be your next Franz Wagner. With maybe a little more upside. Now, it's unlikely for him to reach his ultimate upside, but Franz Wagner is the type of player I'd love to have on this team. And Buzelis is taller. So, I like I love Buzelis. I love taking a chance on him. Do you think we move up from top five odds? I feel like the Spurs can slip. Uh, the Spurs play the... Pistons on the last game of the regular season, so if they win that game, uh, yeah, then we are tied for them. Tied with them. Sean Dawes has a serious question. Do you think Jody will now chase a similar sale price to that of the Timberwolves? I don't think she actually, like, makes money off the sale price, and she's waiting. I don't know. They might have to force her to sell, honestly. It's hard to even talk about a sale because I don't think one is on the horizon, unfortunately. If you guys have any other questions, I'll answer them. If not, we're going to be live tomorrow on our second channel. Link in the description. And then we have another post game show tomorrow as well.
Appreciate you guys hanging out, talking with me. Interesting tidbit Eric dropped earlier, man. Interesting. There's a lot of storylines this offseason, guys. Guys and girls. There's a lot of interesting storylines that are going to be fun to make content about, and it's going to be interesting to figure out. Like, yes, it sucks that the team sucks and they're directionless, but I'm kind of entertained by some of these storylines, which makes them interesting, in my opinion, to pay attention to this team in the offseason. No, I'm not just sitting here begging for you to watch my content by trying to get you guys intrigued. I truly do believe that this is going to be a very interesting offseason. And hopefully you watch my content. <laughs> what do you think about Buzella's challenging Rooster Shea? I like it. I like it. I like that attitude, man. It's not really going to change where I have Buzella's. I mean, I already have him at two. I'm not putting him above Sar because of that. All right, but I like it. I like it. What's the next injured player that Cronin will acquire? Odds. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You you bring in injury-prone players, then you're like, oh, wow, our players got injured, man. Like, what could we ever do? One month until the lottery, though? Yeah, lottery is May 12th, a little bit earlier this year, and it's April 11th. The season ends a little bit later this year, so there's less time between the end of the season and the lottery. I kind of like that. Kind of like that. Charlie Spencer says, Scoot looking much better. Shaden has massive potential and is really good at basketball. Yeah, there's some good things. There's some good things for sure. And the guards are it. The guards are it. And you got some good veterans. How do you get on the track towards a championship is the question. Did we do Tankathon? Yes, we got sixth. Thoughts on Sears from Bama. He's good, but he's... How many... Upperclassmen... Six foot or shorter point guards panned out in the NBA. The only guy I can think of is Isaiah Thomas. He might be able to play his way into like a backup point guard type role, but he's going to get destroyed on defense. And man, is he really going to be able to score at the NBA level given his lack of size in 34 minutes a game he only averaged four assists like is he going to be a plus playmaker for others at his size he kind of just feels like a G League scoring guard that plays in summer league and averages like 22 points per game in summer league and then goes back to the G League Thoughts on Grant Nelson? He had a good tournament run, run, so people were talking about him, but he he's 6'10", not good defensively, shot 27% from three this year. I, I don't know. He Late second. Late second. He's a he's a four year player. If he is a freshman, I'd probably take him in the first round. If he was as good as he is now. The thing is with him, it's not like Buzelis where he struggled from three for a year. Uh Nelson last three years. Thirty two percent from three, twenty seven percent from three, twenty seven percent from three. It's hard to that's more of a sample size. It's more of a pattern. So it's harder to project him as somebody that could ultimately become a shooter because he's older and because he has multiple years of struggling. So that's the difference. Um, and I think it's going to be harder for him to beat guys off the dribble in the NBA. He's a, he's a late second. Would you draft Bronny James? Not... For his capabilities as a basketball player right now, he needs to go back to school for another year and actually produce because he wasn't good this year.
Would you like to see his GM of this team? I uh, I don't know. Not Joe Cronin. Uh, no, I don't know. Somebody better. Whoever that may be. What backup point guard would you take in late second round as backup to Scoot and Ant? I think we need a game manager in reserve. Um, I'm starting to really like Tyler Kolick, but he's a first round guy. Maybe early second. I wouldn't draft him for the Blazers. Uh, AJ Mitchell doesn't really make sense to me because he's... I don't think he's going to be a good defender. Um, Tristan Newton would be an intriguing guy to take. He's big enough to guard some twos, I think, and can rebound, can pass. Shout out to Truly Spencer PDX two dollar donation says your GM first three to five moves you do to turn this around. Thank you, Sp Truly Spencer, for the donation. We're gonna end the stream on this. Um, sorry, I'm an I'm annoyed at a text and Let me answer this question. Uh, first three to five moves, I would shop Grant. I would trade Brogdon. I would see what's out there for Ant, but I'm not planning on trading him. But like, if you can get a Franz Wagner, maybe do that. Then I'm drafting with both the draft picks. And then you're going into next year seeing what you can do guard-wise. Anyway, thank you, Spencer, for your donation. That's going to wrap up this stream. We'll be live again tomorrow with two streams, so hopefully you can tune in for that. Um, Post-game show, 9.30 p.m. approximately, and Blazers Uprise live. We're doing 15 games for picks against spread on our second channel. Anyway, shout out to you guys for hanging out with us. Shout out to Eric hanging out there down in Vegas. That was fun. Uh, Blazers lose. 21 and 59. And, uh, yeah, man, we'll see if they can move up in the lottery because they still have a chance one game back of the Spurs and the Hornets. Blazers have to lose out in order to move up, though. We'll see if they can do so. Anyway, appreciate all of you. I forgot to shout out Smog, member for 39 months earlier. So I'll end with that. Scoot number one in assists and number six in points for rookies. Yeah, we'll have to talk more about Scoot's playmaking next stream, see where he's at. He might average seven assists per 36. This season for a rookie, which would put him in pretty rare company. Shout out to Smog for being a member. Shout out to all of you guys. I appreciate it. You guys hanging out with me. I'm out here. I'll catch you next time. Until then, as always, peace out. Go Blazers.